Do I start now? Yep. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Tabernacle Live. I'm Brother Paul Williams. Welcome to Taylor Tabernacle Live, where our physical church is located in Philadelphia, PA, and Elder John Ford is our pastor. We invite you to worship with us at any time. Please visit our website and learn more about us at www.taylortabernacle.com. At this time, we have our, our scripture reading from Ephesians 6, 10, 13. I will give you a moment to find it. Following our scripture, we have a prayer by Brother Ryan Williams. Hopefully everyone has it. Ephesians 6, 10, 13. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, please bow your heads for a moment of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you. To, we come to you in this troubling time, and I just want to ask you to cover us in your blood, uh, Lord. Just help us to get through this, Lord, and just help everyone to stay safe and healthy. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Good morning, Taylor family. Good morning. So wonderful. Wish I could see each and every one of you, but I see your posts on the side here. Good morning. We're going to bless and lift the name of the Lord this morning. We just thank everyone who's, who's logged in and joined us this morning. We hope we have a word from the Lord for you that will bless your soul this morning. Hey, I'm going to ask you to turn to Matthew chapter 22 verses. We're going to work through verses one through 14. I'm going to give you a few minutes. We just thank you this morning for joining us, and we are so excited to be in front of you. You guys know me. You know I like for you to talk back, so I want to see those little uh, chat things. You just keep going. I hope, uh, I know, I heard, I saw somebody say a dreary day. Oh, it's liquid sunshine. We bless the Lord for all of the liquid sunshine this morning. If you have it, Matthew 22, we're going to start at verse 1 and go through verse 14. Ready? The parable of the wedding feast. And Jesus answered and spoke to them again by parable and said, The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son and went out and sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding. And they were not willing to come. Again, he sent out other servants saying, tell those who are invited. See, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fatted calf are killed and all things are ready. Come to the wedding. But they made light of it and went their way. One to his own farm, another to his business. And the rest seized his servants, treated them pitifully and killed them. But when the king heard about it, he was furious and he sent out his armies, destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Then he said to the servants, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore, go into the highways and as many as you find, invite to the wedding. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together although all whom they found both bad and good and the wedding hall was filled with guests but when the king came in to see the guests he saw a man 
there who had not on a wedding garment. So he said to his friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, bind him hand and foot, take away and take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth for many are called, but few are chosen. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. If you give me a few moments this morning, I want to talk to you on the topic. Have you changed your clothes? Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you this morning, Lord. We ask you, Lord, to decrease me and increase your word, Lord. We ask you to let your word not come back void, Lord. We thank you this morning for all things. We thank you that you have kept us and you continue to keep us through this time, Lord. We just bless and praise your holy name this morning, Lord. We hope that this word touches some soul this morning. In Jesus' precious name, I pray. Amen. Hey, a quick introduction. The book of Matthew is thought to be written by Matthew, but it does not specifically state such. Uh, but the author is extremely familiar with Jewish history and the logistics. He describes Jerusalem as the holy city, which puts Matthew written during the period of 50 to 60 AD. This morning, we're going to look at Matthew 22, the parable of the wedding feast. This passage depicts in vivid description God's kingdom and the marriage of the, the wedding feast of the lamb. Of course, the king is God himself, God the father. The son is Jesus Christ. The invited guests are God's chosen people, Israel. Israel who received him not, scorned him and rejected him. The guests that received the final invitation to the marriage feast are you and I, pulled from the highways and hedges, both good and bad. And in the final analysis, both Jew and Gentile, all who believe in Jesus Christ. Our focus today is going to be on the unprepared wedding guest. Just a little bit of background about a Jewish wedding or Jewish marriage. In biblical times, Jewish weddings involved several numerous steps, several steps. First, the couple made a marriage contract, which was the base of the marriage. About a year later, the groom went to the bride's house where she was presented to him. Then a nighttime procession to the groom's house where a festive wedding banquet was held. This banquet could last up to a week, depending on how wealthy the groom's family was. Let's start at verse one and we're gonna work our way down. The marriage of the marriage is arranged of the king's son. Announcements went out well in advance, just as they do nowadays. We call them save the dates. So guests can prepare. So you can get your new new outfit, get her, get your hair done, make travel arrangements, find lodging, get a gift. But the guests who received the first announcements or first invitations, they threw them to the side. They discarded them. We don't need them. I, it's unimportant. The first servant that bought the first invitations in this parable was John the Baptist. He foretold the coming of the Messiah. Israel was uninterested. They felt as though they were God's chosen people. I'm a shoe in I don't need this. Mark 1, 2 through 4, as it is written in the prophets, behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for the remissions of sin. John the Baptist lived a strict lifestyle. He was called eccentric. He was clothed in camel hair. He ate locusts and wild honey. He lived a disciplined life. He clothed himself in a manner acceptable and pleasing to God. Not his outer clothing, but his spiritual garments. Verse four, 
Another invitation went out by other servants. Come, all is prepared. I have set out the finest feast for my son's marriage. They paid the king's servant no attention, made excuses, dismissed the invitation. Others mistreated, even killed the king's servants. When word got back to the king, he was furious. To disrespect a servant of the king is to disrespect the king. The second invitation was delivered by none other than our savior himself, Jesus Christ and his disciples. Jesus, the son of man, the son of God, part of the holy triune, bruised for our transgressions, wounded for our iniquity. He was crucified for bringing the invitation to the lamb's marriage feast. Still many of Israel ignored God's invitation. The banquet is ready. But those who the king invited rejected their invitation. They were not worthy. They have, I have extended my best to them, to my people, to Israel, and they rejected my invitation. Matthew 10, 11 through 14. Now, whatever city or town you enter, inquire who is who in it is worthy and stay there till, till you go out. And when you go into a neighbor, in, into a household, greet it. If the household is worthy, let your presence come unto it. I'm sorry, let your presence come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. And whoever will not receive you nor hear your word, when you depart from that house or city, shake off the dust from your feet. The king sent his servant out again, go out to the highways and all you find invite to the wedding. The good, the bad, the rich, the poor, all may come. The hall of the great banquet was open for all to attend. Some chose to ignore it, just like Israel. Some continued to ignore it. Other guests chose to accept the invitation to the wedding feast, but all were invited, both Jew and Gentile. Verse 10, the wedding hall is filled, filled with people of every walk of life. Can you feel the excitement? I'm going to see the king. I got an invitation. I accepted my invitation to the wedding feast, the wedding feast of the perfect lamb. I'm prepared. I changed my clothes. My hair is looking good. My dress is perfect. The king is coming. The king enters to see all who have come. The hall is filled. I imagine in my mind's eye, hundreds upon hundreds of people, thousands and thousands of people. We're talking about the marriage feast of the son of God. The king comes in and all the guests are adorned in their best clothes, the best perfume, beautiful robes in every of every color and every type. Can you see it? All the guests adorn in their very best, but one stands out. Of all the people in the great hall, one person, one guest stands out. This guest is part of, a, part of the group that was pulled off the street. Many of the guests, when they received their invitation, they ran and changed their clothes. Can you hear their excitement? I'm going to the king's wedding reception for his son, for Jesus. I must prepare. My finest outfit, my hair is combed, my, I'm bathed, I changed my shoes. I must prepare to be a guest at the wedding feast. It is an honor to be selected to be a guest at the wedding feast, no less the son of a king the king. This is the wedding feast of the perfect lamb. It doesn't matter if you were invited first or the 10th to be invited. You have an invitation to sit at the king's table. Because of such an honor, you have a responsibility to prepare. How dirty and tattered this guest must have been not his best. He just looked like he didn't care. Perhaps he said to himself, this is nothing special. It's just an everyday event. I can go as I am. The king won't notice me. The filth on this guest must have been unbelievable. The stench produced must have filled the room. The stench the king's smell had to offend him. 
you're invited to a special event, but you did not think enough of your invitation to clean yourself up. The king approached this guest in verse 12. Friend, he greeted him as friend, a warm and familiar greeting. The king knew this guest, perhaps long ago. Friend, how did you come here in this great hall to this great event with no wedding garment? How did you come unprepared? He asked specifically, how did you come here without a wedding garment? Meaning there is a, there is a special and specific preparation and attire for this event. The king gave the unprepared guests a chance to explain the situation, explain himself. The guest was speechless. He had no words to adequately, adequately explain why he was so unprepared, so out of place, why he didn't even change his clothes. Verse 13, the king gave the order, bind him hand and foot, take him away and throw him into outer darkness. The man showed himself to be an imposter, showed he did not belong here. Maybe the king knew this man once. Maybe that's why he greeted him as friend. But now he was a stranger to the king. He was disobedient. He neglected his obligation to observe the rules to be a wedding guest. The wedding, more importantly, the king's son's wedding. The wedding of the perfect lamb. The prince of peace, the rose of Sharon. The king was, <clears throat> excuse me, the king was saying, get out of here. I don't know you. He does not belong. His disobedience makes him unworthy to attend the wedding feast. Cast him into outer darkness, not into the street, not out of here, but into outer darkness. Sounds to me like a point of no return. This guest has been bound hand and foot. He can't help himself. He's been thrown out to a place of no return. There's no coming back. He can't go home and change and return and correct his error. He had one chance, one shot at being a guest at the table. Now he is cast out with no hope, no hope. He's in the dark. He has no way back. He can't help himself. He can't get out of his circumstance. Looking back, I bet he wished he had prepared. He's out there flailing around. He can't even untie himself and there's no one to help him. He is weeping, he's shouting, he's begging, he's angry. If only he had prepared. If only he had changed his clothes. Now the guests had to face the outer darkness, the judgment of the king. Luke 13, 25 through 28, when once the master of the house has risen up and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and knock at the door saying, Lord, Lord, open for us. And he will answer and say to you, I do not know you where you are from. Then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence and you taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know you where you are from. Depart from me all you workers of iniquity, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and yourselves thrust out. The filth and the stench the king saw and smelt were all symbolic of how this guest lived his life. This guest lived like he wanted to and thought it was okay. The king extended the invitation, the invitation to salvation, to dine at the marriage feast of Jesus. The guest accepted, he accepted the invitation to salvation and he thought that was enough. He, the guest thought that 
That was all he had to do. He thought he was in. He thought the king would accept any old thing. He thought God would accept any old thing. He thought he couldn't come to the king's house, the king's table, and into God's presence without cleaning himself up. He thought the invitation sealed the deal. The king spotted this one guest out of the whole place. <clears throat> the guest accepted the invitation, but he did not bother to change his clothes. He didn't bother to prepare. He accepted the, the invitation while he was out in the world, but he did not bother to prepare for the occasion. He kept on the same old clothes. He kept on the coat of unclean thoughts a pair of pants of unforgiveness, a shirt of unkindness, shoes run over with anger and a hat of self-righteousness. His stench of hate was unbearable to a loving and kind king, a loving and kind God, a God who through a loving act of redemption was scoffed at by his own people, by Israel. Instead of turning away from all of us, he opened a door for all of us. What a slap in the face to the king. What a slap in the face to God for his guest to think he could come to God's table any old kind of way. Let me be clear. There's only one way to salvation. Only through Jesus Christ can you be saved. You must believe Jesus died for your sin through the repentance of sin and asking for Jesus to forgive you and come into your life. No other way. As a new believer in Jesus Christ, when you accept the invitation to salvation, he gives us a new garment. He cleans us up and washes us in his blood. Romans 10, 9 and 10. That is, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, one believer unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made into salvation. Isaiah 61 and 10, I, am great, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. But this guest, this one unprepared guest, whether Jew or Gentile, had his undergarment on. He had his invitation. He accepted the invitation. We know this to be true because the king greeted him as friend. He could have had a beautiful white undergarment on. He could have had the garment of salvation on, but it was hidden by the filthy rags he continued to wear. Today, right now, we're living in an unprecedented time. Most of the people alive today have never experienced anything like what we are living through right now. Not since 1918, the Spanish flu epidemic or pandemic. A busy world has stopped on a dime. Can you imagine? Because we couldn't have a few short weeks ago. It is like the world has stopped the clock and reversed the hands of time in some way. Parents are home with their children. We're helping them with homework again. We're cooking dinner again. Even though I hear the ladies complaining, we're kind of tired of cooking. I'm lucky enough. I have a husband who does cook though. Amen. I can hear you saying amen out there. But we're cooking dinner again. We're eating as a family again, not stuffing fast food down our throats as we rush from the next to the next thing on our overcrowded schedule. We're spending the time that we used to complain we didn't have a few short weeks ago with our families. Kids are playing outside with their, uh, again, playing games with their families. No more schedules. They keep them and us so busy we cannot enjoy our time with them. Our limited time with them. They grow fast and before you know it, they're gone. But more importantly, we have to spend time with God. The world is quiet now. You can hear your thoughts now. 
You're not running at the speed of light to the next thing on your to-do list. I frequently see on Facebook <clears throat> and chatting with friends that our schedules are off. We're sleeping late. We're working from home. Although they say this, that this could be, that this is worse. Some people can't stand to work from home. They say they're working harder than they ever did. Keeps buzzing. Can you see if somebody's saying something? Sorry. <clears throat> Some people are saying working from home is so much worse. But there is some time during your day before you log on or before you log off or after you log off, you should find time to spend with God. Maybe after everyone is asleep or before the house wakes up. Among all the jokes and rantings on the internet and Facebook, one of my favorites is I washed all my pajamas today so I can have work clothes next week. Now, let's be honest, tights, yoga pants, pajamas are the attire of the working class right now. Hair undone, salons are closed, nails undone, salon, uh, nail salons are closed. We all look crazy right now. And I'm sure some people on occasions are recycling that outfit to the next day. Be honest. We shower and put a pair of yoga pants back on because let's be honest, we're only going from the living room to the kitchen and back. And that's often more times than we care to admit. Changing our outer clothes is not, our, is not all important right now. Now we have time in our day, time to spend with God and time for him to talk to us, to talk with us. Time to change some of the things about ourselves. Time to change our clothes. I'm not talking about the outward clothes. I'm talking about the inward appearance. Time to work on that anger issue. Time to work on forgiving. Time to show mercy to that person you feel has done you wrong. The only way to do that is to spend time in God's word. One of our deacons we always hear say, write the word on the fleshly tables of your heart. He simply means the word has to be down inside you. When the word becomes part of you, it is so much easier to live by. It's easy to memorize the verses, but if you don't take time to dig beneath the surface of God's word, you will never get to know him. Second Corinthians 3, 3, clearly you are an epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but by the spirit of the living God, not on tables of stone, but on tables of flesh that is of the heart. So many people are stressed right now. Where's my next paycheck coming from? How am I gonna feed my family? So much loss of life, so much grief, so many concerns about the country and our leaders today, so much uncertainty. God is the answer. He has the answer. It's in his word, cast all your cares on him. 1 Peter 5, 6, and 7, therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. It's time to change your clothes, church. Time to take off anger and put on joy, unspeakable joy. Time to take off unforgiveness and put on forgiveness. Time to take off impatience and put on meekness. Time to take off cruelty and put on mercy. Time to take off meanness, put on kindness. Take off pride, put on humility. Time to change your clothes. Time to take off hate and put on love. Colossians 3, 12 through 14. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies kindness, humility, meekness, long suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond. Verse 14, 
For many are called, but few are chosen. We have been invited to be the guests at the wedding, at the wedding of the perfect lamb. You've accepted the invitation, but ask yourself, have I changed my clothes? Are you still wearing the same old clothes when you accepted the invitation or have you changed your clothes? Have you taken off the worldly clothes you had on when his servant found you? Because make no mistake, he found you. He's never been lost. He was the same yesterday. He's the same today and he'll be the same forevermore. He chose you. You didn't make that choice. You had the choice to accept the invitation. Have you changed your clothes? Have you taken off cursing? Have you taken off defiling your body? Because from the moment you accepted his invitation, your body became his temple. And he won't live in a bandominium. And for those of you who don't know, a bandominium is a torn down ghetto version of a condominium. He's not going to live in it. Have you taken off lying? Have you taken off cheating? Have you taken off stealing? Have you changed your clothes? Our obligation is to change our clothes when we accept the invitation of salvation, the invitation to the lamb's marriage feast, the marriage of the perfect lamb to his bride, the church. Philippians 3, 14, I press toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of, Christ, of God in Christ Jesus to work toward the prize of a high calling. Are you preparing to be a guest at the wedding feast? No, you probably can't change your clothes all at once. I'm not telling you to, uh, and, and it's too big a job for you to do alone. But as I said earlier, you must get the word down inside you. And you need a personal relationship with Jesus Christ in order to do that. As a new guest at the king's table, it can take time. Those of us who are seasoned guests, even we have work to do. None are perfect, no, not one. The only perfect is the perfect lamb of God, Jesus Christ. But work every day towards changing you, towards changing your clothes, changing the things about yourself that would cause God who would cause the king at the marriage feast to say, bind him hand and foot and cast him out into utter darkness. There are others in the Bible that change their clothes. The prodigal son, Luke 15 and uh, 22. But the father said to the servant, bring out his best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. The prodigal son changed his clothes. The prodigal son's confession of faith caused his father to change his clothes from rags, the rags of a beggar, to the clothes of the son of a rich man, the best robe he had, to put a ring on his finger. This was a sign of full restoration to his father's house, to his family. He took off the clothes of an arrogant son and changed his clothes to a humble and grateful son. His confession of sin changed his clothes. He was now ready to be a guest at his father's table. John 20, 17, Jesus said to her, do not cling to me for I have not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father and to my God and your God. Jesus changed his clothes. One Friday evening, he hung on Calvary's cross. He wore clothes filled with sin and shame, the stench of the world of sin on him. Clothes of a sin sick world, clothes worn and tattered, not the clothes of the perfect son, not the clothes of a perfect lamb that he was. He was buried in a borrowed tomb. But early one Sunday morning, he got up and he changed his clothes. He got up and changed his clothes from mortal to immortality. He changed his clothes to a robe white as snow, spotless, the perfect sacrifice. 
He changed his clothes so he could present us faultless before his father, our father. He changed his clothes so you and I could get an invitation at the king's table, an invitation to the marriage feast of the perfect lamb. I encourage you today, don't be the unprepared guest. Change your clothes. You can't go to the king's table any kind of way. The king, God himself, will not accept anything. Don't wait until you get to the feast and hear, depart, I know you not. Don't get cast into outer darkness. Change your clothes. If this message has touched you in any way, and if you would like to accept the invitation to become a part of the family of Jesus Christ, I invite you to invite Jesus into your life. Please pray this simple prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, I confess my sins and humbly repent. I believe your son Jesus died for my sins. I ask you to come into my life. Be Lord of my life. Amen. If you are making that decision now, call us, email us, send us a note through our website or social media so that we may pray with you and for you and connect with you or with a friend to help guide you through the Bible. You can reach us at 215-748-4578. That's our number. You can leave a message and someone will get back to you as quickly as possible. Or you can reach us on our website, taylortabernacle.com. Connect with us and let's celebrate what God is speaking over your life. Amen. 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 Hey, the church's needs continue. If you've enjoyed this broadcast today, and we thank you for joining us for this broadcast and would like to support this ministry through giving, giving tithes, offering, please go to our website, www.taylortabernacle.com backslash giving and follow the instructions to give online through or to give online. You may also give through the U.S. Postal Service. And that address is Taylor Tabernacle, P.O. Box 6309, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, 19139. You may also give through text. You may text the code Taylor61, now on your phone, to the number 73256. You will get a link sent back to complete your donation. Again, please support this ministry by giving via our website, U.S. mail, or through text. Amen. Now I'd like to give the benediction. Thank you all for your, your uh, chat room, I see it is buzzing. It is buzzing mightily. Amen. Amen. I hope you received that word today and I hope it blessed your hearts. I can't wait till we're all together again. We're going to have a good time. Amen. Our benediction now unto him who is able to keep you from stumbling and present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To God, our Savior, who is wise, who is also is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forevermore. Amen. We remind you that our deacons and prayer teams are waiting for your call. 215-748-4578 and on the website at taylortabernacle.com. Thank you so much for joining our broadcast today. We hope it was a blessing for you. Hit subscribe so we can, we'll know you're out there on our YouTube page and you'll be informed of any and all gatherings that we have. Pastor Jonathan Ford will be back next week at 10 a.m. It's Holy Communion Sunday. We look forward to worshiping with you again. We pray for you and you pray for us. Thank you for joining us. <laughs>